On Sunday night, in his COVID update, in what some might think is a complete juxtaposition, South Africa's health minister, Dr. William Kize, mentioned that the public-private partnership included medical aids and specifically the assistance of Adrian Gore, who is the founder of Discovery Holdings. So, in this race for a vaccine for developing countries, how do people come first over short-term profits? And joining us now to give us uh, some insight into all of this is the Chief Executive Officer of Discovery Health, Ryan Noach. Thanks so much for your time. Welcome to Morning Live. Good morning, Sakina, and thanks for having me. Ryan, before we get into the details of your participation as a medical aid company, um, you must be aware of some of the absolute distress of South Africans, especially for those in the front line uh, with regard to having an um, option of a COVID-19 vaccine anytime soon. So do you have any clarity better than the rest of us as to just how far we are and how soon we can expect to have vaccines, at least for frontline workers? Well, we're acutely aware of this distress. We're dealing with members every single day. This is a desperately tragic disease, and uh, we're, we're seeing families terribly impacted uh, by early morbidity and early deaths, unfortunately. Um, the disease is really at a, at a peak in the country at the moment. Uh, and the healthcare infrastructure is under tremendous pressure. Uh, the, the timelines for the vaccine are uh, uncertain to me as they are to you. Our minister announced that he aspires to have it in the country an early set of doses for the first high risk groups by February. Um, and uh, we're expecting then the COVAX set of vaccines to come through the COVAX initiative by. Uh, quarter two, probably, hopefully, March 2021. Uh, I think the insight that I have is that behind the scenes, I'm seeing tireless and exhaustive high-energy work uh, by a large team of very capable people who are working as quickly and as hard as they can to get these vaccines in quickly. Mm. So, if you could explain to us exactly how Discovery and or other medical aids at this point will actually assist with regard to a COVID-19 vaccine or vaccines, um, uh, you know, have the medical aid, uh, the aid schemes themselves, have they met independently to discuss all of this? Yes, so we're very excited, in fact, to be participating in this collaborative initiative with the Department of Health. Uh, through our regulator, the Council for Medical Schemes, our industry associations were approached, the Health Funders Association, of which Discovery is a member, and also the Board of Healthcare Funders, a second industry association. Um, and we, through discussions with the Council for Medical Schemes, uh, have warmly received an initiative wherein medical schemes will fund for their members um, and Adult medical scheme members, those eligible for the vaccine, represent about 7.1 million South Africans, or about 15% of the population. So the medical schemes will provide funding from their risk funds for members, not from savings funds, directly from the scheme risk funds. In pricing the vaccine for medical schemes, the medical schemes will pay a slightly higher price than the cost price, generating a surplus from the medical schemes purchasing these vaccines. And this surplus will be used to fund an additional 15% of South African adults to receive the vaccine. So it's a cross-subsidized initiative on a one-for-one -one basis. And that means that through this medical schemes funding initiative, about 30% of South Africans will gain access to the vaccine. So, just to be clear, uh, Ryan, are you saying, therefore, that uh, those uh, members of the South African public that belong to medical aid schemes will definitely have access to the vaccine? Absolutely. Um, there's no question that medical scheme members will have access. And in addition, the price paid by medical schemes generates a surplus for an additional 15% of non-medical scheme members to be funded for the vaccine as well. 
So there's, there's quite a few questions around this particular issue uh, because when you say that you will uh, be accessing the vaccine, of course, uh, for your members and they will have access to it, uh, what does that mean in the broader rollout as you understand it as per your discussions with government? Because we were told that, you know, at first uh, this will be administered in phases, of course. It will be frontline workers. It will be uh, certain uh, people in high-risk categories. So just give us your explanation of exactly how this is going to work and when it comes to your members as medical aid schemes, how this will be done as well. Absolutely. A very important question. The prioritization of who gets the vaccine first is being worked on and has been uh, provided recommendations for that from the COVID-19 Ministerial Advisory Committee on Vaccines, being led by Prof Barry Shoup. Of course, it makes complete sense, and we're seeing countries across the world ensuring that higher-risk populations get the vaccine first. And this should be no different in South Africa. It would be entirely inappropriate for a young, healthy person to be vaccinated when a high-risk person or a frontline worker has not yet received the vaccine. Of course, we need to get the vaccine to these high-risk individuals and frontline workers first to try and reduce the burden of morbidity and mortality that we're seeing and reduce the pressure on the entire healthcare system. So this funding initiative should not be construed to be any change to the prioritization of who gets the vaccine first. And just in terms of how much of the vaccine will be acquired and how and when we are likely to have that administered in South Africa. Can you talk us through that, please? This is a very important question. The Ministerial Advisory Committee has guided that we should target 67% of the population in order to achieve the first level of herd immunity and to be able to take the pressure off the healthcare system and hopefully return our economy to normal and really protect our people. So in order to achieve this 67%, the first 10% of South Africans are being funded through the government's collaboration with COVAX, which, as you know, through the Solidarity Fund, a deposit was made with COVAX and vaccines secured for the first 10% of at-risk South Africans. The next 30% will be funded through this medical scheme initiative that I described earlier, 15% being medical scheme members, and an additional 15% being members of the public cross-subsidized through the medical scheme initiative. So that takes us to 40% of the population now, which is a very good start. And there are current talks underway with business leadership, with corporate South Africa, um, and through other fundraising initiatives. Through a task team created by the minister, and reporting directly to the Minister of Health, called the COVID-19 uh, Vaccine Financing Committee. Um, and that committee, which is uh, being led by Adrian Gore, uh, is currently working on raising funding for the next 27% so that we can reach this 67% coverage target. So, so how exactly will the balance of that fund be raised, that uh, next 27%? Um, and, and also, um, just how sure are we of actually securing vaccines? Look, the truth is we've got quite some time before we need the next 27%, considering through the minister's initiatives we now have 40% coverage already, um, and 40% is about 23 million people or so. So we've got quite some time to go before we, we actually need that money. That said, there's been no delay in the fundraising activity. Uh, these talks are on, underway. Nothing is yet finalized, but uh, I'm optimistic that this financing task team being led by the minister um, and, uh, and consisting of both private and public representatives of both private and public health care and both sectors, in fact, business sectors, uh, will raise the money. Uh, on the timelines, uh, as per your earlier question, uh, I'm not certain, um, and we're waiting to finalise the procurement arrangements. Uh, the minister is aspiring to get the first doses into the country in February, as we heard on his webinar a couple of nights ago. Mm. So the sceptics uh, would ask, Ryan, did you as, you know, uh, private entities 
did you not enter into any uh, sort of uh, uh, regu any sort of deals, you know, um, uh, contracts with uh, pharmaceutical companies to actually procure some of these vaccines for your members prior to uh, this deal with government? It shouldn't only be the skeptics asking that question. I mean, I think that's an entirely logical question. Um, and the truth is that we've been engaging with the vaccine manufacturers for, for many months now. Uh, truthfully, the vaccine manufacturers uh, really prefer to work through governments in each country. As you can imagine, there's overwhelming global demand. Uh, they're being approached from all over the place. Uh, and it just would be logistically impossible and unfeasible for them to have multiple points of contact in every country. So their strong preference is to work through governments. There is, of course, also a very powerful ethical rationale for that, to make sure that there is a strongly coordinated national effort with the vaccination being offered first to the highest risk groups in the population. Uh, and so, you know, notwithstanding our conversations with the manufacturers over time, uh, this is now being centrally procured and coordinated by the Minister of Health. From the South African Health Products Regulatory Authority's perspective, do you have any indication as to how long it might take to get any vaccination approval at this point, Ryan? I have no specific indication. SAPRA has been very clear that they are prepared to follow an expedited approval process. They're working closely we understand with their counterparts in other countries like the uh, US FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, similar bodies in the United Kingdom and elsewhere in the world, so that prior recognition work and prior research that's been done can uh, not be repeated in our country and can be used for this more expedited approval. I understand that they've received some data from some of the manufacturers, uh, Pfizer and AstraZeneca, although some of the phase three clinical trial data is still outstanding. Uh, and as they aggregate this data, they're looking at it as it comes in. So we're hoping for this expedited approval. Now, Ryan, what, what would this mean in terms of premiums for uh, medical aid subscribers? Uh, are we likely to see increases in premiums? Well, our projections at the moment, I should start off by saying that the final cost of this vaccination uh, is yet to be confirmed. There, there may be a mix of vaccines used. Uh, there's a price range of these vaccines and the final purchase price and the logistics of administering the vaccines are yet to be uh, fully understood. But based on a range of prices um, and understanding what the upper limit of that could be, uh, this is likely to cost medical schemes no more than 2% of their annual gross premium income. So of all the contributions paid by members to the entire industry in a year, this is likely to cost slightly below 2% of that. So while it is uh, expensive and uh, a large RAND value, it is not that material to medical schemes. So even if it does require some adjustment to members' contributions, it would be a very small adjustment immaterial largely in the context of things. Also important to say that during 2020, uh, it was an unusual period of healthcare utilization for medical schemes. Non-COVID related healthcare utilization was much lower than in a typical healthcare year. And as a result, some schemes ended the year with quite large surpluses, larger than they expected. And this should definitely help to fund the vaccine to some extent. Uh, so you say small, but, but what does that mean? Um, if you were to express it perhaps, and I know this is not an exact science right now, but as a percentage, uh, what would be, we be looking at if you say a small increase? Well, the total costs across the industry, as I said, are less than 2% of premium income. Uh, it's impossible to actually project where schemes will end at the end of 21 now. Um, you know, the, uh, the actuarial projections are quite difficult at this stage because healthcare utilization uh, has, is looking so different to typical patterns. So I, I would not hazard a guess as to exactly what the impact is, but I can assure consumers 
that schemes ended 2020 with a healthy surplus, and that in the case of Discovery Health Medical Scheme, who I can speak for, it's unlikely to have any kind of material impact on contribution increases. Now, Ryan, for people, for patients who have already tested COVID positive, uh, are they now seen as higher risk patients? Um, I'm not sure I understand your question. In, in the context of vaccines, people who have tested COVID-19 positive are still candidates for the vaccine. The vaccine causes a larger antibody response than it seems a historic infection does. And the manufacturer's recommendations are, in fact, that people who have been previously infected do indeed receive the vaccine. Is that what you were asking? That's exactly what I was asking. Uh, so um, in terms of that, you know, would there be any sort of adjustment to uh, their profile in terms of the medical aid schemes at this point? No, no, not as far as I understand. The clear recommendation seems to be that irrespective of whether you've had the infection or not, the vaccine remains important and beneficial. So, uh, uh, Ryan, I know you've said, uh, you know, you're not an expert in this area, but uh, you, you do have quite a broad, a broad and substantive knowledge of uh, what is going on. Um, so let's talk about some of the possible vaccines at this time. Um, what exactly are you looking at? Uh, which ones are you targeting? Well, the clinical data has only been released for three of the vaccines to date, the Pfizer vaccine, the Moderna vaccine and the Oxford vaccine, which is being distributed by AstraZeneca. These are the only three companies for which I've seen, um, you know, published evidence-based clinical data. Uh, and the good news, the excellent news, that as a, as, a, as a humanity across the entire world we should be delighted about, is that the safety data looks unequivocally good and the efficacy data also looks uh, very good. And so we are optimistic that this is a safe and effective vaccine. We've seen in uh, countries that have started the vaccination program that while there have been a few anecdotal reports of early adverse effects, otherwise it's been completely safe um, and it's been well received by the populations. And so we are really holding thumbs uh, that, uh, you know, as this rolls out, it proves to be as effective as the trial data seems to indicate. Mm. Uh, what about Chinese and Russian vaccines that other countries seem to have taken up um, with no efficacy yet? Um, you know, and are there any others that you uh, perhaps are aware of that we are not? There are something like 200 vaccines that are currently being researched globally at the moment. Uh, of course, We've been following in the media the rollout of the Sputnik V vaccine in Russia um, and the uh, Sinovac and other Chinese vaccines in China. Unfortunately, as confirmed by Dr. Anban Pillay and Prof. Barry Shub on the minister's uh, webinar just the other night, uh, the phase three clinical trial data has not been released for those vaccines. Um, we have a very uh, effective medicine regulatory control process in South Africa. Uh, SAPRA, the South African Health Products and Regulatory Authority, is a very effective regulatory body uh, that, that looks after the public by ensuring the safety and the efficacy of medicines that are registered in South Africa. And so until this trial data is released and is available for public and for regulatory scrutiny, uh, I don't foresee those vaccines being registered in South Africa until that point. One is very hopeful that these Russian and Chinese vaccines are also safe and effective, uh, and we just need the trial data to be able to understand that fully. So, uh, a final question. Um, I'm sure you have seen uh, that letter penned by some of South Africa's uh, eminent scientists who are asking a lot of questions, who are saying that we haven't demanded uh, or, or rather secured nearly enough of the vaccines to reach the sort of targets that we're talking about right now. And subsequently, more and more South Africans are also demanding a detailed plan. H how soon do you think that may be possible to share with the country? Uh, I don't know a date. And all I can say is that as soon as possible, uh, I'm aware of the furious work that's going on in the background to try and achieve this. 
Um, and, uh, you know, we're doing all we can on our side to support and applaud this. Um, from our point of view, you know, we consider this to be probably one of the most important public health interventions of the century. We would want nothing more than to get vaccination for our members and, of course, for the broader South African public. Um, and, uh, you know, we are standing first in line. Discovery Health Medical Scheme secured funding for the vaccine some months ago, ring-fenced funds within the medical scheme, uh, and is ready to pay for the vaccine as soon as a secure supply is confirmed for our country. So, um, you know, we, we understand that urgency and we share that feeling. Well, we have to leave it there. Thank you so much for your time this morning. CEO of Discovery Health, Ryan Noach, talking to us about their participation in securing COVID-19 vaccines for South Africa.